introductions. Um, Ginger McCall, National Public Records Advocate. Mary Beth Herford, State Archivist. Mark Landauer with the Special Districts Association of Oregon. And forgive me, I will need to leave just a tad early for a few appointments over the cap. I'm hoping that we'll finish early. I am too. Yay. Stephanie <laughs> uh, Clark, Oregon State Archives. There are a couple people that have typed in Karen Hewitt by computer. AJ Ripka with City of Springfield. Um, Karen Hewitt is from Port Okay. Scott Winkles with the League of Oregon Cities. Todd Albert, Deputy Public Records Advocate. Liz Craig, Oregon Dad. Steve Sewell from the Oregonian. And I want to mention also Tony Hernandez, uh, the public member, is, uh, said he is running late. Be here by 1.30. Yeah, Les, um, Les also told me that he'll be here at about 1.30. Michael Crone of the Attorney General's Office. Great. Um, so we have the agenda. I, oh, I'm sorry. Folks in the back. Cameron Miles, legislative council. Oh, you need them? Right now, thank you. Thank you, Sue Ryan, City of Newburgh and Oregon Association of Engineers for Recording. Great. All right, so we have the agenda. Um, and I did want to just renew our prior policy of allowing members of the public to step up during the agenda item if you have something to say. Um, I think that's a more valuable way to foster participation. So if you have something to say on a particular agenda item, we'll open up for comments on each agenda item as we come. So first off is the legislative update. Uh, we had two bills before the legislature. Um, Back in December, we had all spoken, I believe, and we had strategized about how we were going to get those introduced. Um, Todd and I went around and uh, did the sort of legislative equivalent of selling Girl Scout cookies, and we found ourselves several co-sponsors for that. Uh, Representative Power was the one who introduced it, Senator Thatcher co-sponsored, um, as well as a few other senators as well. And so both of those bills did get introduced. Um, they both had a public hearing on March 13th. And from there, their fate to split. So for 2430, uh, that was the one to renew the Public Records Advisory Council to make it a permanent council as opposed to sunsetting in 2021. Uh, that got passed out of the committee that it was in. Uh, it was a due pass recommendation, uh, and it did in fact pass in the House, and it has now moved on to the Senate, and we just found out that that has been referred to the Business and General Government Committee. So Todd and I are going to work on getting meetings with the relevant folks on that committee um, to get this bill moving. And the other bill, which is the four annual reporting requirements that we had all agreed upon, uh, that one had four fiscal assessments attached to it. Um, three of them were indeterminate, and one of them was, I think, $90,000, right, DHS? And one uh, full-time entity. Yeah, so DHS said that they would have to have a full-time employee. Um, three others, pharmacy, parole, and OYA said that it was indeterminate. Um, so Todd and I have been meeting with those folks, and I think that we've made some good progress in getting them to uh, dial down their fiscal assessments. Um, we did hear back from parole, right, that they were going to lower theirs to minimal, right? Their staff is recommending that they lower it to minimal, and the board has to adopt that. Yeah. So we're working on them. It was DHS, OIA, the Board of Parole, and one of them. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Yeah, we've been working with them to just try to explain what the requirements are, talk to them about how those requirements can be less onerous for them, and how they might comply with it in a way that won't cost them a lot of money. Um, and we have had some success there, I think. So. Um, so that is currently in Ways and Means, and um, hopefully we'll get it moved out of there soon. I am a bit unfamiliar with what the what happens after that. So what what is the process? Well, I, all right, I'm, I'll take a stab at this, and then Rob and Scott can correct me. Um, but um, typically, a policy bill that has fiscal impact that is not directly tied to a budget of a particular agency. So for example, a fee bill that the agency pushes will typically be pushed along with the budget itself. Whereas policy measures such as this typically uh, sit in the committee until you get the close of session forecast, which this year will be May 15th. That's 
when they know how much money there theoretically is um, and therefore can begin to allocate funds to the various bills that will have an impact to the state budget and have that have been referred to the Ways and Means Committee. I think that that's an easy way to describe it. Okay. That's fair. And I think we're still waiting to hear what subcommittee it's going to go to for right. Ways and Means. And I that, think we shall. typically wait for, for that time period. Okay. I would well. guess general government. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, yeah that's and I reached out to some of those folks and did have some meetings with some of them back in January or December just to sort of give them a heads up because we knew this bill was probably going to get a couple of fiscal assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think it would be advantageous to follow up with them to try to yes. ensure, okay, and, and to keep working with the agencies who have set the fiscal on it? Okay. Because a lot of times if you can get them to reduce their fiscal or eliminate their fiscal, then it goes through ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Also, just let you guys know, DHS, even if they don't eliminate their fiscal, are willing to speak directly to any subcommittee members on ways and means that the bill goes to to explain why they uniquely have an actual number on it as opposed to other agencies that are indeterminate or minimal. And just curious if Ginger wants to, have you guys got some benefits of that? Or that makes a difference. Well, I would continue to work with them to try to get that number reduced. Every penny counts. Okay. What is their rationale? They are uh, they're large. They don't have an up-to-date system or policy, and they're geographically distributed, where many of the requests come in through localities, like there's over 100 different locations, all of which can also process public records requests, so there's no centralization of data anywhere. So they expect to have to put someone at the top and maybe even a system to accompany it in order to adequately process the data and collect it in a way that's responsive to the reporting order. Where was Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Transportation? Everyone but the four in the fiscal said minimal. Yeah, I should tell you something. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, that should tell you something. I'm sorry, those two other agencies are, are also the biggest agencies in the state, yeah. and so um, you may want to consider um, talking a bit more with the Department of Human Services. Yeah, they seemed open to having conversations or suggestions that we might have. I had also thought maybe we could reach out to some of those other decentralized agencies to find out what their processes are. Um, and I think would be another perfect example. Yeah, because they have a lot of regional offices. <laughs> Any of your natural resource agencies have offices throughout the state, too, so if they came back with. Yeah, but they're all typically pretty small in comparison. DEQ is the biggest, uh, well, maybe even AG. You might want to check AG, too. But, but correct. Oh, yeah, yeah that's correct. a good point, too. Yeah, and I thought of reaching out, too, to some of the folks that I know at federal agencies. Like Department of Labor is very decentralized. DHS has a lot of branch offices. Um, talk to them about what their processes are because they also have annual reporting requirements. So, um, so that is where we are on our two bills. Uh, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Um, Todd, do you have anything to add? All right. We're already ahead of schedule. Um, the survey updates. Uh, we did send out the surveys. Um, we've been using SurveyMonkey for that, I believe. Uh, there was a slight delay, a little hiccup. Uh, if you have less than 100 survey responses on SurveyMonkey, it's easy to access them. If you have more than 100, then you have to pay for the product. Uh, and it's a minimal cost, but it turns out that there's maximum bureaucracy involved in paying that minimal cost. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> we got to even roll in what Oregon buys. Is that it? Yeah. So yeah. We, we were going to have to eventually anyway. This is our first. Well, no, we were going to enroll in Oregon. I did enroll in Oregon buys for this and then did a work for about two weeks despite multiple efforts and attempts to help me. And then finally, uh, Secretary of State Business Services decided, you know what, we could, no, it was Dad's actually, I'm sorry, Brian Shop decided, you know, they could actually pay for it on their spots card when they saw my plate. They did pay for it. We did access all 106 responses. Oh. And now by paying for serving one of these fancy services, yeah. we were missing 101 to 106 responses. But now by paying for serving one of these, the last time that we did, it actually gave us the ability to export all the data to an 
Excel spreadsheet as opposed to my typing all 106 responses into the Excel spreadsheet, which I started to do. <laughs> Where it's happening now. Win -win. And so, this is it, yeah. And, and in working with the data so far, I it has identified a few areas to think about for the future, which is one of the questions, in my opinion, to any public body should be, what is the name of your public body? <laughs> and honestly, but just simply by asking people like, who is filling this out? Who is your data person or public records person? Didn't doesn't always identify the agency involved or the public body, which let, we will continue to lead to a lot of googling. <laughs> so there, there is a state agency directory. Oh sure, I'm not gonna, but I mean, a person merely giving their name or their email address it doesn't okay. end up self telling me who they work for. And even the links to the public bodies are sometimes just a link to DAS's policy. So that even doesn't tell me who the public body is. So now we know. Also, uh, although we are grateful for DAS's assistance in getting this survey out to the state agencies, uh, what we didn't realize and what I now know is that we left out Foley, Treasury, DOJ, um, Secretary of State, and others in the executive line that uh, are not directly under DAS. Keep that in mind for the change as well. I'm really there, glad to hear that. They should reach out to you. Although they're not, they, they have to follow the public records law, but they don't. They're not a public entity. Right. And then, and then the university system. That's, the community. that's hard. Yeah. yeah. Because again, when they decentralized the university system, yeah. there was really no way. Yeah. But those are all ones that we need yeah. to access again. Because heck, is not real good at and they they don't necessarily work with the smaller state institutions like southern eastern western right. and oip I, I would like to add just one more point in talking to the four agencies that put any kind of fiscal on the issue 2431 for three of them we had their data from the survey which has proved very useful in our conversations with them to point to their numbers and their issues so it's already off. What did the Board of Pharmacy look like? How many public records requests did you have? A lot. Yeah. No. Well, and the but this is a licensing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those are public, those are available online, but if, for instance, to prove it to another jurisdiction, say another state, they still need an official version from the Board of Pharmacy. And so that apparently happens a lot. They have maybe 500 and something requests mm -hmm. for the year. That's a pretty large related, number. Yes. And most of them are related to license verification. No, yeah. I, that sort of surprised me that they stick a fiscal, but now I think they understand. Um, I mean, to, you don't have to treat that as a public records request, right? You can just make available to your licensees a certification. And we pointed that out to them that their ability to define public records, request, public records requests within their public records policy, but they were um, unconvinced okay. by that argument. I know that I completed the survey for DAS and I had emailed you talk okay. about the, the difference between question one and two and I think some people answered differently mm -hmm. so I'm wondering I don't know if that is going to have any sort of measurable effect on the data but I think question one was uh, how many records requested your agency or public body complete within the statutory 15 day timeline and then number two was how many public records requests did your agency complete within 60 days and I interpreted number two to be not within the 15 day timeline but within 60 days yeah. other people combine them uh, um, and so uh, just a, maybe next time around just a clarification on what exactly you're looking for there or what we're looking for there turns out that survey research methodology <laughs> is actually kind of complex yeah. Um, but yeah so we're learning and we did get some good results back, and I think that we will be able to do useful things with those. Uh, one of the useful things that I'm hoping to do with those is, since we asked them for a link to their public records policy, we want to compile a list of public records policies and contacts and put that on our own website, which we're hoping to revamp soon. And I can give you what I, to some of them, some of the redo policies that we're getting in from agencies include public records requests, so I can forward those all to you once I look at them so that you have a, a link to the, for which agencies have submitted. Oh, Ginger, one other point. Jason Rude was on the phone informing that the state actually does have its own survey tool. And so uh, I haven't attempted to figure it out yet. So let's go work on survey monkey, but that might be an option for next year. It might make it a little easier to keep this information in house. 
housing. Yeah. No need to go to the emergency board to pay fifteen dollars to be serving on <laughs> So yeah, um, we're learning, uh, but we did get the results and we do have some plans for what we're going to do with them. Uh, we're also planning on putting together a report with an executive summary based on the data that we've gotten and making the data itself as well as the reports available to the public. Um, and we did have some interest in that already, right? You mentioned by a gentleman who wanted the, the data. Yep. So um, anyone have any other thoughts or questions about the survey? The so the 106, what, uh, how many? What was the return rate? Yeah, was it, yeah exactly. Thank yeah. You. you know, I'm not sure, I don't know how many dads sent it out to. I know the non-state email. So if you want to get me that number, I can compare and compare. I, I was just copied on the email you sent to the agencies, but it was just like a header of like directors. So I don't think it's the same. It does, I know. I have to try to figure out how to, I'll look at it. Okay. I'm not sure. That's a good question, though, TBD. Yeah, and that includes uh, the locals as well, too. Yeah. Just, are you able to just sort of... Bother? Yeah, you thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, like, how, how, how the locals differ from the state agencies? Or? In terms of numbers or response? Yeah, the, the rate of response. Well... I think we did 50 non-state agencies. We have 106 responses, and I have not really read through them all the period. I feel like it's a fairly even mix right now between state and non-state public bodies, but I don't know the breakdown. But I did get a lot of calls during the process from all levels of government asking clarification questions, which I really appreciate it. So those who did it were invested, wanted to do it right. We did get some people who expressed disappointment that they were not among the uh, non-state agencies being surveyed. They really wanted to participate. So, what's your estimate, time estimate for making the report available? Or yeah, making the results report available. I think we could probably make the results available pretty soon within the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the report, we'll have to go through and actually look at the results and look for trends and compile things. So, I think probably mid-summer for that. I, if you haven't planned on this already, for transparency's sake and incentivization, it might be good to list the people who didn't respond. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe when we send out the data, let you respond it and then reattach the press release for whatever you sent out that it was originally sent to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Did you send it to the agency directors for the state? Who, did, who were the people that were addressed? Yes, it went to, we have a distribution list at DAF for agency heads, and so it was. So just keep in mind that there are a lot of people who fill it out more know, so when you're publishing a list that went to directors, mm -hmm. it's like calling out directors, not the people who are actually responsible for the content. That's true, but it's a fairly common practice for us to send I know, the these, these types of, yeah. to, get, to get passed on, but it doesn't always happen. And Liz, can you remind me that we also do with um, the public information officers? I'd have to go back and look to be sure. You know, I did forward the, re the email request with the link to communications directors at some point. It wasn't necessarily but early on. Maybe it was a reminder. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get all I'll, I'll get all those details and send you an email. But Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments on the survey? All right, moving right along. Um, <clears throat> training updates. So we have a few trainings. We're working on, for, for right now, we're working on doing our summer training schedule. Um, we do have a few things in the works. I know, Todd, you have one that you're going to be doing uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then Springfield, Springfield. And I think it's going to be the regional level. And then in May, I'm going to Redmond to train uh, law enforcement folks uh, at a conference there. In June, we're hoping to go down to Klamath and potentially Medford and Ashland to do some trainings down there, both public trainings as well as government training. Um, we had an invitation from Department of Corrections to take some trips and train some of their folks. So we're hoping to put something together there, uh, possibly for August. 
Um, but we're very interested in hearing your ideas for trainings that we should do, um, folks that we should reach out to, conferences especially. Um, I was just sending our conference organizer email. Perfect. <laughs> for next year's annual conference, which I don't know where it will be. Ours is in Bend the last week in September, so okay. lovely time to go to Bend. Tough time to be in Central Oregon. Very good. <laughs> And also, Ginger, one thing we haven't had a chance to discuss, but Stephanie and then Andy both mentioned the Attorney General's Public Law Conference. That's a good idea. It's coming up in October, and we're invited to participate. Okay. Although I think the format is still developing. And we're hoping to do, we've been up until this point, a lot of times relying on the records management folks to do outreach for us and let people know about the trainings, but we're hoping to also start doing some outreach on our own. Um, especially to some of the decentralized agencies like DHS branch offices, um, all of the agencies that we listed before, OHA, DEQ, um, state lands, they all have people out in other locations around the state. So, And I am hoping to organize some more public trainings, uh, probably one here in Salem and then another up in Portland, uh, but also to, if we're traveling, organize public trainings in the places that we're traveling to. So we'll be doing government trainings as well as public trainings. Um, I put a call out on Twitter to members of the public. You know, if you have a group that you'd like to have trained, we'd be happy to come and train you. Just let me know. Um, so some people have seemed pretty interested in that. Uh, I'm also going to do some targeted outreach to newsrooms and to university journalism programs. Uh, there are a fair number of those around the state, and I think that's a good place. I did do some trainings last fall at a couple of university journalism programs, uh, and I found that to be very fruitful. We do a podcast if you have any interest in. That would be great. Yeah, I would love that. I'll email you offline if it works. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And we did get a couple of video trainings up online on our website. Uh, one is targeted at government folks, and the other one is for the public. Uh, and we have linked to those on the website in case people want to watch them. Uh, other One other outreach thing, I forgot to add this to the agenda, but I wanted to let you guys know, we did do some events uh, for Sunshine Week this year. We put out a call for reporters to submit to us news stories that they had written using public records requests, and we did put together a gallery of news stories that used public records requests in order to create a story um, to highlight the importance of public records requests. And we also, with the help of the governor, uh, honored several government employees who were nominated by members of the public or the press for their good work on public records requests or policies. Um, and the governor actually took the time to sign the letters for those folks, and then we, we uh, took them out to those folks. So I think that that was pretty successful. People seem pretty happy about it, so we're hoping to do that again next year. Um, let's see. Request for assistance update. I did put together uh, a printed out chart of our request for assistance. We are up to how many? 159 requests for assistance since the office started last year, uh, which was April 25th. I looked it up. So there was a pretty good clip. We're getting a lot of requests for assistance. There's been a slight dip in the last couple of weeks, uh, but we are getting continual calls and emails. Uh, Todd, did you want to talk about any in particular? Well, I, I think interestingly enough, uh, several, or we're getting a fair amount of repeat requesters, and I think that's because people honestly have been satisfied with the advice you've been able to provide, even if it's merely, you know, this is why you're probably not entitled to the record or may not get it, or why it's okay for them to say no. They, people are requesters, both the general public and the media are viewing us as a neutral third party that can intervene and explain a lot of them in a way that isn't. You know, potentially protective of the agency when you're explaining what's available under the law. We're also getting a lot of referrals, again, from the general public and uh, people in the media are telling others about us and recommending that they use our service. And I think just the fact of our existence is spreading that people are finding us more quickly, even on their own, when they're looking for help on public records issues. And I think all of those together kind of led to the uptick in requests that we got after the new year that 
continued pretty steadily up until a few weeks ago. And one issue that I'm seeing repeated in different localities, uh, although not necessarily at the state level, although it has come up there too, is uh, public officials elected or otherwise using social media or other private technology sources to conduct government business and then not necessarily be forthcoming with that information. And also that public bodies are following the law, rightly in my opinion, in saying that they can ask for that elected or appointed official to, you know, um, go through their own information, but then have to rely on a good faith assertion of that individual that they have nothing responsive to the request and that they can't really like compel an in-camera inspection of that person's private material to see if there are public records. And so that's happening more often, or at least we're getting more calls about it. So it's definitely, I think, one trend worth identifying and maybe thinking about how we can follow up on it. I know for years, Open Oregon Board and then even our, our division has struggled with the whole thing of training elected officials, especially local government elected officials. But if it's not mandatory, most of them do not show up. I know a couple of cities have made it a mandatory training. Um, I'd like to see that happen because it's going gonna, it, it's gonna to continue. I mean, there's no... I mean, they just do what, do what they want to do and until they get caught and that sort of thing, then they don't really change. So I think that's a real education piece mm -hmm. that needs to happen. And for those on the phone, we've just been joined by Tony Hernandez and Les. Welcome, Les. Good to see you all. <laughs> the rain went quick. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we hope to be doing some more targeted outreach to localities, to local elected officials. Um, also, I wanted to note that for our training in Klamath, um, Todd has done some outreach to the tribes there. So we're working on that. I'm waiting to hear back. Yeah. Um, how many, uh, if, you, if you ballpark fine, how many cities are using the, the service? Because we, we, have, we have this unique spot. The, we we have not provided formal mediation for any city as of yet, but we're getting calls both from requesters making requests to the city, but also uh, recorders. Yeah, and we're and we're you know we participate in the recorders forum that has to be on there. OAMR. OAMR. Thank you. We're very active. Yes, and we're 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 a happy participant in that. So we do some of the meetings we learn about our services and our reaching out. We haven't really done, I mean, we haven't really had the occasion to do any kind of formal mediation. It's been informal dispute resolution, and it's been coming from all kinds of folks, you know, on the government side as well as on the public side. That's good. So I was at a bar association event last Saturday, and it was a mix of reporters. It was a kind of media law and access uh, discussion. And it was a mix of reporters and government folks, prosecutors, defense attorneys. And I was pleased to look around the room and I had talked to pretty much all of the reporters that were in the room at some point. We'd offered assistance to pretty much all of them. So that made me feel like we were doing pretty good on that outreach. So I was really happy about that. So I think that people, by and large, working in the media around Oregon know about us. Um, I think we still have some work to do to get the public to know about us. Uh, but that's certainly something that we're working on. How many, uh, how many just a week or uh, a month have you guys um, uh, as far as requests for us? Yeah, for a while we were getting pretty much one every day. Um, it's dipped a little bit in the last couple of weeks, um, maybe because of the legislative session. I'm not sure. But yeah, we were getting an average of about one per day. And how long did it take to resolve? Is there a some Highly are, variable. Yes. Some are as easy as just a phone call or an email back, and others are ongoing. Yeah, some of them require a little bit of research to answer a question about the law. Um, some of them require calling multiple people to try to move a request along. Sometimes they require multiple follow-up calls when all you get is people's voicemail. Um, so yeah, some of them get resolved inside of a conversation on the phone, and some of them take a couple of weeks to resolve. Right. 
So um, the next topic is kind of the, the big one, uh, future plans and focus areas. So as I understand it, even though we're in the midst of the long legislative session now and the next one is going to be for another two years, there are a series of deadlines that will be coming up surprisingly quickly after the end of this legislative session. Um, so if we want to start putting together some other legislative proposals, now would probably be the time to start talking about areas that we want to be looking at. Um, and this is where I'm really looking to you to, to give us your thoughts on what we should be focusing on as far as legislative proposals uh, or other initiatives. I mean, it seems like there's a very good chance that this council is going to become permanent. So we want to make sure that we're doing things that continue to justify our existence. Um, so do folks have thoughts on areas that we can focus in the future? Um, the one thing I want to note is that we should try not to step on the toes of the Sunshine Committee. So probably we shouldn't be looking at exemptions. Oh, and Honestly, <laughs> 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 my thought this session has been, and it's reinforced by you and Todd talking about all the good work that you're doing, but I kind of wish the legislature would leave the law alone for a little while. That's where I was going. Preach. Figure out like, what is and isn't actually worth doing. And I think that's a good thing. Actually, working with the reforms that we put into place. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, this is more of a sunshine committee complaint than a this committee complaint, but we're supposed to review all the exemptions and they're gonna add, you know, fifty new ones a year, that's gonna be we're not gonna be able to do our job. So that my own view is like I feel like we did really good work in twenty seventeen. Um, I think we should be paying attention to what you guys are finding on the ground obviously, but I am I would say, and I, I'm not sure if everybody in the room is familiar, but there are two other measures that are making their way through the process that I think are important for us to, first of all, acknowledge. And those would be House Bills 2353 and House Bill 3399. House Bill 3399, yeah. Oh, it died. I guess. Which which one is that? Is that, uh, the, that would be the one to... that would have required public entities that are suing requesters to actually uh, require the DA to be the um, substitute the DA for the uh, private uh, public records requester. Is that a fair way to? Describe it, Cameron, or the attorney general, or the attorney general if you're a state. And and you know personally, I'm probably going to get over my skis here a little bit, but I I personally have found it a little bit troubling that public bodies are are actually counter suing individuals when they have made public records requests. And if that bill is dead, then I think it's something that that we might want to consider having a discussion about the other bill which is 2353 thank you for that camera mark mark I, before you go on can i just come this is rob yeah i figured because, you were going to jump well i'm only interrupting because while that bill may be dead as a numbered bill um the intention is to continue to work on the issue and to stuff a solution into a generic bill in house rules. So it's not it's not really dead. Okay, that, thank you for that, Rob. And certainly on life support, I'll say that. Well, I, I you know, I, I just just from a quote unquote impartial neutral party, I, I find that to be a real troubling trend. That I, concur. I, 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 I have a little bit of problem digesting, if you will, being from the public side. Um, the other bill, 2353, is the bill that the Society of Professional Journalists have been uh, pushing very um, effectively, and that is to find public bodies that uh, unreasonably delay or do not produce. Um, a properly and valid public records request. Um, I included properly 
and <laughs> so forth. But um, it, it does put a $200 fine into statute, and it would furthermore um, provide a means by which either the D, I guess the DA or the AG, could require the production of those uh, records at either a reduced or free, uh, cost or for free if you were uh, found to have unreasonably delayed or not produced those records. Um, and that was, at least, I'm, I'm not speaking for SPJ, but their um, point was that the, the timelines need to have some kind of an enforcement mechanism. Is that a fair characterization, Les? Yeah, well, I, I guess I'm not directly involved in, and I'm not speaking for SPJ, but that, that is the intent. I can tell you from recent experiences, it's what I am doing. <laughs> I think that's an accurate description. Yeah, and, and I mean, from my perspective, and I think we originally came in saying, give us time to make sure all our people are trained. And personally, when I saw it, it's going to be $200, the squeeze isn't worth the juice, except for the attorney fees. And when that was removed, then I'm done. It's, it's just, it's not as high of a priority, but um, it, I think that that was one of the biggest um, complaints from uh, folks about the measure that was enacted back in 2017 was that there really wasn't any kind of enforcement or penalty for people who, for one reason or another, aren't being done. So that one, I believe, did it get kicked away the means? Is that where it is right now? The penalty I, I, I can look it up. Um, I think it, I, I don't think it needs a ways and means. It's still a judiciary, judiciary and uh, they, apparently there was a amendment adopted just yesterday. So, so what happens to it? Because the time expired on. No, no, no. It was, it was, but they, have, they just had to have a hearing. Oh, oh my they, they had a work session actually on it on Monday. Okay. So, so it's still it's still alive. And they adopted the dash four amendment, and that amendment um, again two hundred dollars, and uh, the AG or the district attorney may order a fee waiver or reduction if the public body has done has responded to the request with undue delay or has failed to respond according to the timeline. And that one's going to the House floor. It's not going to Ways and Means. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, I do like the idea of if the, the bill regarding suing requesters, if that dies, I do think that's maybe something we should take up. It has been mentioned that perhaps the alternative to suing the district attorney or the AG would be to sue the record, the in re you know, record or something like that. Um, that to me seems like a better solution. Um, and, and if I may, I, I mean, my, my issue here is that you get somebody who's acting in good faith, making a public records request that the, the re public body then has to personally sue that individual. Yeah. And, and I don't think somebody should become financially responsible for uh, something like this when they're simply, you know, theoretically making a public records request in good faith. And I, I yeah. just have a problem with that. And I have gotten calls from some folks who are on the wrong side of that, who requesters who got sued. And even if you are a media company, that can be quite costly oh, and very problematic. They end up just dropping the request. So could this is Rob again. Can I interject real quickly? And just let you know that there is a dash two amendment to 3399 that did satisfy us, I say us being the district attorneys, um, and I think probably satisfied the attorney general as well. It's not called out as an in rem proceeding, but basically it lays it out that way. The dash twos aren't posted on OLIS because we never got that far, but from my perspective, the dash twos to 3399 are the starting point for further discussions in house rules, and I'm happy to share the dash twos with anybody who wants them. Thank you, Rob. So if the document is being sued, who represents the document? I think the idea is that the requester or the AG slash DA has the right to appear, but are not required to appear. And 
Uh, is this the one that said something about if nobody appears on the part of the document that directs the court to consider the order requiring them to disclose? Indeed, that's kind of what, how it lays it out. So it gives the requester and the D or the DA the right to appear, you know, if they want to, but it removes, I think, the incentive that it would otherwise be created to rule in favor of the party that doesn't get to see you. <laughs> right. But it, also, but it also removes the petitioner from being named as the defendant. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, against the party that what's the difference? I mean, is there a material difference between suing the record and then just or giving the public body? There is because if you get sued and you don't file an answer, you get defaulted within thirty days and then the other side can submit a judgment. So this would eliminate that weird situation where you know, private parties that don't have attorneys are sued and if they don't do anything or they don't know what to do or they have to hire an attorney or do any of that stuff. So it avoids it avoids the whole ORCP process for defaulting people. And so one way or another, the judge is going to decide everybody will have the right to appear if they want to, but nobody's going to be compelled to represent somebody else. And um, the judge is ultimately going to have to make a decision. Plus, just being named in a lawsuit can have implications mm -hmm. for people. I mean, I would have to report to the bar if I was named in a lawsuit. My husband has a security clearance. That's a thing that has to be reported to security clearances. So, I mean, just being named in a lawsuit can be a huge inconvenience. So, that's great. If that bill is still in play with that amendment, I think that's a good solution. Um, if it doesn't end up passing, then that may be something that we'd want to take up um, for the next session. Um, I had heard, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, there was another bill, I think, that SPJ had introduced through Representative Power. Yes, this is the, the, this is the one on fees. Okay, that one's dead. Which one? The, uh, that's uh, 2345, I believe. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I'll look that one up, but I think it's 2345. Okay. Um, also, I, I wanted to note for folks, if you didn't see it, uh, Todd came up with a brilliant idea to put together a spreadsheet that had a list of all the public records related bills that were in for this session. Uh, we put that together with the help of Legislative Council's offices, um, Open Government Impact Statements, which are really great, I just want to say again. Um, so we put that spreadsheet together and put it up online on our website and sent it out on Twitter and people, I, we heard from a lot of people that that was very useful for them to just have a list of public records related bills that were in play. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were exemptions. There were a huge number of new exemptions that were introduced this session. So, uh, that's the request for assistance. Um, the, the list of bills you can find on our website, we want to update that now that a lot of those bills aren't in play anymore. Um, there was one bill that was particularly interesting that would have required requesters to say why they wanted a document. Yeah, um, that's that was that yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I just went that well up against the wall. Former, leg yeah. that former legislator yeah. request. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure that that had been killed on Twitter within three hours of the reporter <laughs> finding out about it. Um, so that one's dead, but there were a whole bunch of other bills and we do still have that list up on our website. But I did hear from people that that was something that they found very useful, so it's something that we're hoping to do again going forward. I haven't seen it. Are you guys tracking the status of the bill? Because that's the, like what we on the Sunshine Committee website have linked all of Cameron's very helpful reports. But, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how do I put together something that is useful in the sense of like, is this bill like if it's a lot? If it's yeah. dead, no one really should care. But figuring that out seems like yeah. I mean, I think so. Are you guys tracking them in that way? No, but, um, I have that. <laughs> yeah. There was a 79 originally that had an impact. One through engrossing was eliminated impact, and there are 44 that are still alive as of today. Okay. And those are the ones that you guys have listed as having an open government impact. Notably, our bills actually weren't on that list. But that list it didn't have it didn't have the council's bills actually. We weren't. It didn't have, yeah. it didn't have an exemption or the yeah. disclosure public records. So the public records advisory council reporting doesn't affect the actual public records request, but that's not included in that list. Yeah. So we 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 want to take a look at that spreadsheet and update it. Um, 
especially now that we've moved into the later part of the session. So hopefully we will be able to do that if we have some time and bandwidth. I recommend that you keep it the same, like the guided guide of where it ended, so that at the end of the session, and you're left with very few, people can also track back and see yeah. what was proposed last year, two years ago, or three years ago, when we had the Yeah. already have the master list. Because some of these things will probably come back. Yes, they will. They will probably come back in the next session. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
done this research with them. Uh -huh. um, so she may actually have a, a list statement. I agree. Also, on the topic of Open Oregon, um, we did assist Open Oregon in updating their public records guide, and the new guide is now available online on their website. Um, others have thoughts, so fees and the, the suing of requesters, those are the two topics that we've touched on so far. Less. Well, just to take a look at it, because it came up in my little territory or Mount Hurt County, whether we need to take a look at the definition of public body, uh, because I ended up having a city councilor and his attorney and the Ontario city attorney say that city councilors are not public bodies and therefore exempt from the public records law. <laughs> there was no actual legal basis for that interpretation. They didn't call me. <laughs> I suggest that they do. Yeah. <laughs> I wish they had. You know, one thing that we do have to be careful about, and I see this all the time, we see it all the time in the legislative assembly, is one bad, one bad actor creates a whole new statutory framework, and I, I hope you're not necessarily going down that road. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm not a legal wizard. I just, but well, if there, if there was some ambiguity, I didn't, I never thought there was. Um, <laughs> I think it was relying, the legal analysis was relying on a semicolon, if I recall correctly, in the statute. It's a semicolon, and I need to raise that thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't concede it to law applied, but they conceded, well, here's a record. But we're not saying that that's general. Kind of, uh, yeah, kind of vision, yeah. I got what I needed, so we're going to keep here. Would, would not be surprised to see that issue raised this little over there. That was an issue down in Curry County, too. There's, there's Curry County Commissioner that insisted he was not a public official and therefore nothing that he did was a public record. And, um, we, we've had a number of conversations and education sessions and, you know, it, it's, again, it's, it's education and it's something that I think that needs to be addressed with elect, elected officials that regardless of whether you're paid or whether you're, you're um, you know, what your status is, if you are serving in these capacities, you are a public official and you have public records. Well, our professor is an attorney who is just salivating at the prospect of representing us to take that case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I would say we probably don't need to address that legislatively at this point. No, but I think it's more prevalent than you think it is. I mean, because we, we've run into this a number of times, but um, I don't know how you how you fix it. I know. I think it's an education issue, not right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's, a, it's an education or a policy issue, um, but I don't know how you fix it so that it gets spread across the state evenly. I recall, if I recall correctly, when you had talked to me about that, Les, I pulled up a case. It was a very recent case out of uh, Multnomah County that the mayor had claimed for some purpose of, of public records that he wasn't an elected official, and the court said that that's ridiculous. So, and I think I cited that. Yeah, that's why I thought that the fire rose up the hill. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. No, I mean, it is a challenge. Uh, not just with city councilors, but if, oops, I mean, I'm on a parks board, mm -hmm. and I always have to be the buzz kill in the room. So you can't do that. You know? Right. And public works and other staff who don't deal with public records like day in and day out staff those. So it, it, it is a challenge that we continue to wrestle with. Yeah. Can I an idea? Sure. Um, so I, I kind of just seen this um, four point and seeing you know, ideas for the 
project and subcommittees and just listening to this conversation in the last hour. I, I, as a member of the public, um, you know, I'm not really every day in uh, the Capitol, uh, definitely not every day in the newsroom, I kind of question um, what my value or what, what, how best I can contribute to, to this. Um, I really enjoy, you know, not only the aspect that the council uh, is focused on, on shaping up state laws, but the outreach and the component education and this conversation in general about what, um, how, to, how to better reach audiences. Um, it might be, uh, I guess one of the questions could be like, are you getting enough support um, from uh, the public and from us uh, in terms of your outreach efforts? And if not, it might be worthwhile to consider some sort of committee, like a, a subcommittee for outreach and communication so that, you know, at, just off the top of my head, a quarterly newsletter that kind of highlights these kind of funny, I, I would call them funny situations or, or just moments that make you go, hmm, that, that the general public would kind of get a, a you know, good example of and better train themselves with for. So um, I'd like to just kind of point that out and be happy to help. Yeah, I love that idea. The outreach is a big piece, and especially outreach to the public. I mean, it's easy to do outreach to the newsrooms, fairly easy to do outreach to the government, but reaching the broader public, that's, I think, where things get a little bit tricky. Um, I mean, our primary outreach tools thus far have been through public training, through a couple of op-eds that I did, um, through Twitter, but I mean, I think there's a lot of people in the public who don't yet know about us that could potentially be served by the office, so I think that's a fantastic idea. Are you thinking like, I don't know if you're familiar with the DPSST's quarterly bulletin? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have, no, I don't know what but <laughs> Something along those lines where yeah. you don't identify anybody, but you describe yeah a situation, situation and the resolution. Oh, yeah, like a factual scenario. scenario. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean individual. I read it every time. <laughs> yeah. It's not to like point out the person, but the situation. No, no, we don't want to embarrass anybody. But yeah. And one of my goals when we revamp the website is to start doing a blog where we can do a weekly, at least a weekly blog entry. Um, I think that that could be of interest to some people, but yeah, I think it would be a great idea to have some kind of subcommittee devoted to coming up with ideas for outreach. May I make a suggestion? Yes, please. I'll stand because I'm short and you're tall. <laughs> um, I worked with the Extension Service for a number of years in Jefferson County and on the Mushrooms Reservation. One thing that's a very easy outreach tool is to make what you call a loop video. And it's like have an intern, we just have one dude for the city of Newburgh. Costs like three thousand dollars to have George Fox do it for the capstone project, and it's something that you can ship to whoever runs the fairgrounds, and they can put on a TV monitor. And people, if there's one thing you're doing, I'm waiting in line for coffee. You know, they can watch a video, and you have so many fairs that go on across the state that in small areas where I grew up, Kearney County, the fair is the highlight of the social season. It is in Melker County as <coughs> well. Um, people will stand and watch a video playing. We just recently put lobby TVs up instead of bulletin boards because we learned that people weren't reading the other bulletin boards. So as we did a little, you know, reformatting of um, our traditional agenda notices, so we still have the agendas available, but this is for savvy, if you will. And people will sit and watch that TV and, and they won't. So, I mean, it's something that it can be low cost. If you do it one time, you do it right, and you ship it out to all the fairground managers and say, could you play this at your county fair? Okay. I know state fair runs here, and a lot of people from all over the state come. I do too, even though I live in Newburgh. And, you know, I'm taking the tour of the booth, getting my free pencils, getting my free, you know, sticky notes, and hey, there's a, a video. I'm going to stand and watch it because whatever, I'm waiting for the bathroom. Yeah, I like that idea. And we actually, we got to go to the state fair. Um, the archives had a table at the state fair, so that I think would be a good opportunity if archives does that again this year. We could even have our own. Yeah, definitely do that. That's a good idea. Do folks have other thoughts on areas that we can concentrate on? Well, I'll, I'll throw this out there. Um, uh, data is a huge issue, open data um, and access to it. Um, and it's it, it's an issue involving cost, but it's also kind of 
their kind of technical aspects to it. Um, I'm hoping maybe Lee will chime in here too with her experience, but um, I think there are ways that um, the law can be improved that would actually streamline how data is stored and how uh, the manner in which it's released to the public and make it more <coughs> less costly, less complicated, and more useful to all parties involved. Um, but it's a frequent, it, it's, well, maybe I'm a special case, but in, in my experience, in my newsroom, getting data is the hardest um, lift when it comes to public records. Um, and it's hugely useful, it's, it's essential to doing a whole lot of reporting in the public interest. Um, would you agree with that, Lee? You still there? She's yeah, I'm here, I absolutely agree. But like, I, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I feel like a lot of the things that we deal with day to day and have in this in this conversation about public records is, is it affects a lot of the paper, and paper is rapidly becoming like the smallest part of what we're actually dealing with. The one thing that someone has suggested this to me somewhere along the way, and it's been kind of bouncing around in my head is to come up with ways to have requesters collaborate with the actual technical people at the agency. So the problem is a lot of times if someone's making a request that's going through you know, a records officer or a public information officer who's not as familiar with how to export data or you know, any of the technical details of that, and so there are problems. One thing that would be helpful is to try to facilitate communication between the technical folks and the requesters. That was one of the ideas that folks had proposed to me, but it might be useful. I think I'm going to put this idea forward, and you all can hate it, and that's fine, but I, it might be useful to have some subcommittees. So a subcommittee of this council that focuses on fees, a subcommittee of this council that focuses on data and information technology issues, um, a subcommittee that focuses on outreach. Just an idea? So, Steve. You and I have had this discussion pretty frequently. Yeah. And I'm quite honestly, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that the work that you recently did with Sauté, this was pretty remarkable. Um, so my compliment. Thank you. Um, I, I will say, though, for government entities, the bill that was introduced in 2017 caused some consternation. And um, I think that if you were to do a subcommittee, we would likely need to have people from outside of this committee to be participants in that. Because honestly, I don't have the technical capacity or understanding of what Steve's talking about. I don't. <laughs> and there is, that's I mean, exactly why the discussion of this is necessary. Because yeah, I, you know, think I don't have the technical Right. I think it would be valuable if we were able to enlist them, um, people such as the CIO's office, um, and if they hire a chief data officer, uh, is that Actually, we will not hire right. them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So yeah. maybe that person could be part well, of Well, there's a lot of evidence to check, because it's more than just the CIO. See, it's, I think, your point too is the request goes to the PIO and that sort of thing, and because the report isn't right there, they just assume that it's not available when the information is available, and it's just something that just it's going to the wrong place. And and so, but yes, I think we need to have CIOs on board um, and that sort of thing. And there's a, a host of other technical issues that need to be addressed as well. One of them that we run into all the time is technological obsolescence. Mm -hmm. And nobody understands that issue. Why can't I have that? Well, because the machine doesn't exist anymore. I don't have a computer that reads punch cards, so I can't get you that information. Um, but those are things that, so we have the current issues of the current data, but we also have, and, and this is again an educational piece, is, Everybody jumps on board the latest and greatest technology um, without regard to what is the effect on public records. And, and we have that huge issue right now 
um, moving forward with with all sorts of new technologies that are, are coming out or ways to cut costs on technologies. Well, we did a, we did a, we did a website. Oops, so we did a we have on the league website we have the LOC data page where people can go on and pull certain categories of reports. Um, they don't even make a request. They can just go in. We have contracts, property tax data, all that stuff. It wasn't cheap. And we're limited to the vendor. I think our contract allows 10 different categories of, of, of criteria. So it's, I think it's something we're interested in talking about. Um, it's, if we can find a way that's cheaper and more efficient, then I think we're, we're open to it. We would fold. We would fold some public notice report probably into the <laughs> broader conversation. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> so, so, so like, and I don't want to belabor this discussion, um, and I do think it's probably worthy of having a discussion. But um, I'm the lowest common denominator. I, I'll just be honest with you, and I think most of you recognize that. I'm sure. Uh, it drove Michael uh, crazy uh, about two and a half years ago, but ultimately I've got 950 members, half of which don't even have an internet presence. Okay, CIO, what the heck is that for the vast majority of my members, right? So it, it's a difficult conversation because some of, some of, you're talking about outdated you know, technology, we're, the po we're probably the poster child. I'm sure we have people still doing stuff on typewriters and data machines out there. It, it's really that serious. So um, I'm open to the, having the discussion, but there has to be a level of um, understanding that there is a very low denominator out there. And when you create policies that apply statewide, you have to have that recognition going in. So um, again, I think that this is worthy of a, of a discussion, but uh, again, you know, my two cents is, number one, you've got some, people, some, some governments out there that are still working in the 70s or even the 60s. A and B, um, I don't think necessarily anybody on this committee um, are the right people to have that discussion because I think it really is a pretty detailed and complex discussion. So again, I think it's worthy of that dis discussion because the data that you can pull is extraordinarily enlightening. Uh, in some regards, and I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. I just want to be sure that we're not putting people in it to a situation where it's a gotcha, and that's my that's my biggest fear. In yeah. terms of us having the conversation or having a subcommittee where those conversations are occurring, I mean, is it really the case where we need decision makers who have the level of understanding to make decisions, or is it more like if we can get the group of us together and it represents a you know good variety of viewpoints, they can invite and hear from people who do have that expertise. And I, I mean, I think that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. And I will say on the the that's federal advisory. Question, not an idea. Yeah, I mean, I know I like. I, I'm going to take it as an idea. Um, on the federal advisory committee that I'm on, one of the things that they do is just bring in experts on you know FOIA management and on e-discovery software and on technical aspects of, of requests. So I think I know people that could probably speak to that, who could probably come in and talk to us at one of our meetings and just give a half an hour presentation on it so that we would have a better idea of what the issues are. Uh, and I think that we have scheduled a meeting with uh, someone from the CIO's office just in the next couple of weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. so I can also talk to her and, and see if she has some ideas um, I mean, a lot of it, I don't know that this is necessarily a thing that would need a legislative fix, but a lot of it just seems to be facilitating communication between the people who understand the technical aspects and the requesters. So. And I think Steve is pointing to maybe a forward-looking need to, as we're acquiring new mm -hmm. technology systems, to build in transparency. I 
know that's something my boss actually talked about. Yeah. Repeatedly. Transparency by design. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's what we've been trying to do. And then, you know, I mean, a lot of times what happens is people think that we're being obstructionist because we not moving tech, not moving forward with technology. But the problem is, is yes, it does great for this. But it doesn't do that. And, and one of our issues is a lot of technology is great for access, but for preserving that information for the entire life that it needs to be preserved for, it doesn't cut it. And so you lose, and then you lose your transparency. And those are the things that we look at when we're looking at different aspects of technology. And there's a bunch of new stuff out on, you know, I mean, out there that are coming down the pipe really pretty quickly. And I mean, it, it all goes to the whole thing, idea too, of email systems. You know, if you don't have an email system where you can capture, you you don't have custody of the information, you don't have transparency. So is that what we're, I mean, these are all issues we deal with every day here. Um, and there are a ton of people we can bring in from that aspect too to, to have that discussion. It, it's just not a matter of, Oh, well, the technology is there, we can do it. It's how long does that technology last and who has that information? I think also there's there's a big aspect of this that goes down the technology piece, which is if we're talking about sort of like piercing the public agency veil so that you go beyond, remember the gatekeeper is the only person that directly provides you with this data. There's like a cultural liability type issue here as well. If you're like, the low person on the totem pole that handles the data, or even just you're not the person who's like the decision maker in the organization, you're going to be concerned about violating policy, not following your director's goals, and I'm exposing myself or my public body of liability by providing this data, even though like maybe like communications director puts me in touch with this requester. And I think with really sort of any change like this, if you want line staff to kind of go along with it and be both participants, they need to see that from above leadership. And so I think a big part of this is probably education as well, whether there are policy or legal changes that go with it. I think it would have to be a big aspect to be just getting the word out, having them hear it from on high that this is okay. If I'm telling you, you can talk to this person, you can talk to this person, fulfill their request that you need it. And in fact, one of the people that we gave the Sunshine Week award to was a DEQ staff member who, in working with a reporter in Mitchell, Oregon, put her in touch directly with the person who built out the database of that was provided to her and actually worked with her to fix all the changes in it. And it made it such an easier process for her to like collect this data and report on it because she had a direct, she had a direct line to the person who world it was to build that data. And, but that person had the okay to do that. So I just think that's important. Yeah. Subcommittee? Well, so actually, I think that this is maybe a broader conversation. Assuming that we have saved this council from expiring in 2021. What do we want to do going forward? Do we want this to be a council that, I mean, you are a council that oversees my office. That's important to me. But what else do we want to do as part of this council? We can make legislative proposals. We can form some subcommittees to make recommendations and do studies on particular topics. What is it that we want to do going forward? Because it seems like we have a very good chance of continuing to exist in perpetuity. So what do we want to do with that? I mean, it's an opportunity, but you know, aside from the survey is statutorily required, we have to conduct the survey, you have to conduct oversight of my office and give me feedback, but, you know, everything else is kind of open. What are we hoping to do now that we've saved this council from, from expiring? Don't, don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory here, because uh, strange things happen over there. But, um, you know, I do, I agree that, that there's some obvious issues ripe for discussion. I still think it's a bit perhaps premature to get into everything until we have an opportunity to look at the data from the surveys, so on and so forth. Um, but but Steve's issue is something that we should probably get some people in to at least familiarize. Because again, the bill in 2017, I mean, it was Sanskrit or hieroglyphic. To me, it truly was. Which so bill specifically are you referring to? I, uh, I don't get the number either, but the, it was. Uh, Is it like an open data bill? Yeah. Did it, it pass? No. no. Okay. Um, 
But they have one about every session. Every yeah, other session. I mean, that's a big thing on the federal level, too. And, and you know, I, I'd love to learn more about Okay. Personally, I, I, do, <laughs> I don't get I, I think I get the big concept here, but, but you know, transparency by design. I mean, Governor could, could you know, execute an executive order yesterday telling every state agency to do this, but I haven't seen it happen. Uh, you know, Cameron, I, I think that plays back into the time frame. You'd be looking at a 20 year time frame to do that, I think. Because it's like when I was at the Department of Energy, yeah, we had modern computers and software and everything, but the Betsy database, the one for the billion dollar tax credit, was run on Fox Pro, a DOS based program from the 80s that had not been supported in 10 years and had not had an update in 20 years, was running a billion dollar tax credit program. Uh -huh. And it had social security numbers in it, so it was a secure database. Yeah. That is normal for, I mean, it's not just the little guys, it's the big guys too. Um, our legislative council software is DOS based program for all our bills. Um, we use mainframes throughout the state. So any adoption of some of the the governor ordered, it would still take 20 years. If every new procurement had the new standards, it would take 20 years to filter through the entire government. Maybe 20. Yeah, Maybe 30. 30. Yeah. Maybe 30. <laughs> But it's a start. I mean, it is a start. But it's it's not a, I mean, to, to Mark's point, you know, I, we recognize that there are many public bodies out there that are operating on ancient technology. And this is really, our notion was to say prospectively, when you go to buy a new data system, that you have to have the disclosure built in. Right. Disclosability of data has to be a built in feature. Um, and because sometimes agencies do buy new data systems, like DAP just got a new um, personnel management system, I believe. So when that happens, this should be a standard feature. That's that's essentially what that bill says. And, and, and that's that's problematic because nobody thinks about that that's when true. they're building it. They're they're looking at functionality for the business function only. They're not looking at access. They're not looking at retention and disposition. Right. And that's been my complaint all along: is we build these wonderful systems. But there's no way to manage the information that is in those systems. And that's what needs to be done. And I think that's the issue is when you have systems that are being designed, you have to manage the information that's in the system. Well, and, yeah, and, and the, the issue, I guess, for me, at least a couple of years ago, is what does this cost us to have this added, um, you know? Feature or features, yes. and, and and what is the what, cost and, and what, to what the argument with with all these requesters who are right? Right. right. It's, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to build it on the front end than it is to adapt it on the back end, and that's where the and the disconnect is. And and then the the next question I suppose is okay. What are the key elements that need to be contained in what you're talking about? Uh, I mean, at some point, yeah, we probably should have a statewide sort of uh, template or something of this nature that, that would apply. But I don't know what it is, and I don't know what it costs. And we're at the mercy of the computer programmers who are out there um, doing this kind of kind of stuff. And the reality is, is you still have areas of this state and of this country that are on dial. And so until everybody is playing equally in the same pond, you're not going to have, you can't develop a statewide template because people who are using dial-up well, are not, are not going to have the, the accessibility and the capability issues that people who have actually more sophisticated access to, to, to the internet. It's a, it's a big issue, and it's a big issue nationally. I and mean, it's, it's interesting that the National Archives just issued a moratorium on paper to all federal agencies. They are no longer going to be able to create records in paper as of 2021. And I, I am, it was very entertaining to listen to the presentation and their, their whole thing that drove this was the fact that they can't build any more facilities to house paper 
So now we need to look at it from a different perspective. Um, but what's the cost to these federal agencies and where, where is it going to happen and who's overseeing it and how is it going to be done? Um, and what's the standard that's going to be looked at? Um, so it's great to issue, yeah. The, yeah, but you have to have the information behind it. And, and it, it's a more complicated issue than, um, than it looks like on paper. And I agree. I, my predecessor was really looking at open data, and that's 15, 20 years ago. Um, and we still aren't any closer to open data than we were then. Well, it sounds like something for a white discussion. <laughs> we just spent. I can. I will reach out to some folks. I know folks who do a lot of open data work. Um, I can perhaps get us one or two presenters for our next meeting to come and talk to us about that issue specifically. Um, as far as how to go forward, are folks interested in potentially forming some subcommittees? I, I, the point is well taken that we should sort of wait and see what shakes out with the legislature this session before we know where we're going to focus. But are folks open to the idea of having subcommittees? Sure. Yeah. And as far as what will come out of that, I mean, so far, We've done a couple of legislative proposals. Are we interested in doing things like recommendations as opposed to legislative pr proposals? Um, I mean, what are we hoping to do with this council should it be permitted to continue? I don't think that there's really any sideboard to, to what we can and can't do. I mean, we can make best practice recommendations. We can make uh, legislative recommendations. I mean, I don't, I don't see where we're necessarily um, constrained. I feel like, like we've identified three very solid sub substantive issues. issues for our discussion, right? We have the fees. data, the fees, and who gets <laughs> um, which seem like an outreach. Out fees and outreach itself, and right, outreach is as a subcommittee was discussed too. Season itself is a subject that will require a lot of discussion. It's a big one. Soul searching. Okay. So for now, we have four topics we're interested in exploring. I'm going to endeavor to get us someone to speak at our next meeting on the data or open data topic. Does that sound good to folks? I would encourage you all in the time between now and our next meeting to the extent that you have free time. I know it's during the legislative session. Um, the FOIA Advisory Committee, the Federal FOIA Advisory Committee that's run through the Office of Government Information Services, I think would be a potentially useful model for us. Um, I've served on that committee for three terms and I've seen it put forth some really good recommendations. And actually, it's interesting, at the beginning of each of those terms, we'll vote on which subcommittees we want to have, and it's always three subcommittees. And fees and data and technology are always two subcommittees that people say. I mean, these problems are prolific. They're across various governments, state governments, federal government. It's the same sort of issues with public records requests. So I think that we could potentially do good work in those areas. Um, as far as future dates go, how do people feel? Should we wait until, let's see, it's April now. Should we wait until July when the legislative session is over to have our next meeting? Okay. Please. Okay. Some of us are going to be recovering for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll aim for July. <laughs> um, I think, I'm trying to think, I have a couple of obligations in July, so it'll probably be close to mid or very late July, maybe early August. Do other folks have ideas for anything, how the, how the council should move forward, assuming that we get granted a reprieve. I, I, I do think one of the agenda items for that late July, um, early August meeting is sort of a legislative wrap up as well. That's a good idea. I have a question about our, you said that a survey is statutorily required. Are we sure we are like required to survey people? Because I had understood that we were to survey the law and more of a well, let me sense of up. like, review it and look at it from a high level, not like ask think, people questions. I think we are required to conduct surveys. Is this the policy requirement? 
let me let me just pull up the actual text of the law. Does anyone remember which provision it was that created our our council? Like, uh, are we just definitely required to keep asking questions? I mean, that's well, I mean, it's, ga it's information gathering. I think we should be. I think that that is an important responsibility for us, actually. And you bought the survey looking tool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, four seventy-eight. Let me. I I will pull up the text of the statute. I don't really care. No, this is a good question. I'm curious now when I have the website up. So. Yeah, it was my understanding that we actually have to conduct a survey on a regular basis. Yeah, I feel like if I'd known that I'm going to write okay. it, I'm going to take it up. Uh, duties of the Public Records Advisory Council are to survey state agency and other public body practices and procedures for receiving public records, identifying the existence of records responsive to requests and gathering and disclosing responsive records, determining fee estimates and imposing or waiving fees under ORS 192.440, determining and applying exemptions from required disclosure of public records. Oh, yes, so that's the actual provision. Yeah, I still don't think a survey that means like necessarily that we have to send them a poll. Have to look at them. Like you survey the land. Well, but how do we how do we know if we're not asking them? It's not like they're putting this information up on their website. <laughs> they're supposed to be, but we don't know where the websites are. Anyway, we can keep at it. we can keep using survey marks. I guess I don't really think. I mean, I think the surveys gather interesting information for both us and the public. I mean, just to know how many records requests an agency is receiving, that's something that the public doesn't know right now. I know. That's but something I don't know right now. It actually feels like it was misleading information if we have things like the uh, pharmacists making their members make public records requests in order to get certifications. Like, that's a bullshit. That, that might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know that that's happening. We didn't know that before. That's a record request. <laughs> 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 that's a record request. Um, that's a record request. Well, that's 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 I'm sure they'll say, well, it's a record, and they wanted a copy of it, so we made them make a request. And that's what uh, the Portland Police Bureau would say about victims in their crime reports, too. But it's like, it's just how yeah. did that wrong, right? Well, it's, I don't know. It is wrong. We are also, by the way, responsible for examining practices similar to those described in the prior paragraph in other jurisdictions. Uh, identifying inefficiencies and inconsistencies in application of the public records law that impede transparency, and making recommendations on changes in law, policy, and practice that can enhance transparency in public process and government. See, so there is so there's so your so we can make a recommendation to the policy board. Do we do have to some degree this bully pulpit where we can we can expose things that we as a group collectively think are what you said. <laughs> what Michael said shall help for the No. no. You should be yes memo. <laughs> but but I, that that is a, a, an appealing use of the dollars that the council gets is to make those kind of recommendations and to be very public, almost like an audit report, right? Yeah. Because um, when you listen to these issues, I mean, so much of it is, well, half of it is education, but also the other half is attitude, mm -hmm. right? And so I think if, if those um, questionable practitioners are called out for their behavior, that's got some reform value to it, I think. They're not going to want to be called out in public. The pharmacy boards aren't going to want uh, to be, you know, you know, uh, brought up on a drum roll. Who says that you know today's today's agency is? Uh, so 
So I, I see a lot of I said I say lasting value to that function. Yeah. Because not only do you reform that agency, but then it also sort of perks up other folks say, well, I'm not gonna do that. I mean that was very effective with the Portland Police Bureau. Well and I mean they were hit hard by the media for delaying and charging for records and they had to change their practice. And actually our report was cited in a couple of those news stories because it was something that I had noted in my section of the report. Sorry, Ed. No, I, I think I, I, I think it. we all know bad behavior when we when we see it. And that was a pretty stark example. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to hear the Board of Pharmacy's reasoning for it. Why are you doing it this way? Why are you requiring the people you're serving directly regulate? like you are regulating and you are requiring them to submit a public record? I think there's also a risk if you are relying on voluntary service surveys to expose bad behavior, if you call people out for it, then much less likely to respond to voluntary surveys in the future. Perhaps. Well, to yeah, our survey is strictly speaking voluntary. Well, they're actually required. A lot of people didn't respond. To respond. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we should, I think we should definitely take note of which public bodies were surveyed and did not respond. And of course, if a uh, reporting requirement passes, all state agencies will have to report on this as well. Yeah. So I don't know. I, mean, I think the survey is a useful tool, but it's true, not because of the survey, but because of their fiscal, right? Correct. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know this from the well, survey. Which is a matter of all of their numbers. Right. Their numbers are surprisingly high. Yeah. Their numbers are the probably high. And that, depending on what you do here, it still lets you, hey, look at these numbers. Why is the small body having yeah. them? Why don't we talk to them? Exactly. We would have gone out that way as well. I mean, there are actually, there are pluses and minuses to those being treated as public records requests, because if something's a public records request, there are actually rights that attach to that, right? You have the right of appeal, you have a right of review, um, there are deadlines, whereas if it's taken out of the public records request process, you, they would potentially lose some of those remedies, some of those the deadlines, timelines, whatever you want to call them. But I mean, there are, if, if we think that that's an interesting thing, right, they're probably not the only agency that has a lot of very routine requests for information that are part of the public records process. I know on the federal level that um, the Department of Homeland Security has, because they were receiving a huge number of requests for ICE for people asking for their own immigration file, they took that out of the public record system and made it a parallel process. So, I mean, there are recommendations that we can make even related to something like that. But, it, it, I mean, in, in this case, the Board of Nursing and the Board of Medical Examiners did not have a similar fiscal, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fiscal, your, that's a separate issue. Well, yeah. I, I'm just saying, and I mean, so in your survey, so obviously, they have to be receiving just as many, if not more, requests as the Board of Pharmacy. So, how are they handling theirs? And that would be an interesting take too. Is this for their licensee? You know, I mean, obviously, what is happening? Right. It, and I mean, it, it, or or in higher ed, when I request a transcript from my higher ed institution, is that considered a public records request or not? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think there's a lot of things there, and that's another <coughs> issue is consistency in reporting. And, and 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 process and that is a process thing. That's not a. I don't think it's necessarily a legislative thing, but it is a process thing that should be looked at. Excuse me, I have to get back to the cap, but it's to defeat a bill that has a public records exemption in it. So. <laughs> 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 well, let's see. Look at That's my goal. <laughs> Let's see. For now, we have some interesting topics we want to explore. For the next meeting, I'm going to try to bring someone in to speak on data and open data issues. We're aiming to have the next meeting in July or early August. Um, and I would encourage you all to think in the coming months about what you want this council to do. And I, we can be ambitious, and I would encourage you all to be ambitious. Um, I've occasionally been told to be less ambitious, but I think we should be ambitious. Um, the statute gives us pretty broad authority to 
gather information, to make recommendations, so we should be thinking about what we actually want that to look like, assuming that this council will have an indefinite future. How can we be ambitious? Um, so I will work on that for the next meeting. I'll send out some dates to you all, um, and thank you all for being here. Yeah, we're done early. Yeah, well, uh, at the same time, oh, yeah, uh,